And so we're going to talk uh, for an hour or two. There's usually this obligatory uh, introduction. I should talk a little bit about the INET sure. and what this workshop is about, unless you want to talk about it. No, uh, no. Well, okay. Go ahead on okay. Well, no, no. Here, no. stay, stay for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not just reassurance, but it's actually uh, 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 reinforcement and maybe additional material. So INET is a group that was founded several years ago by um, a group of economists and financiers who were somewhat uh, concerned about the way economics was developing as a field. Uh, and it's a very heterogeneous group of people with very diverse point of views. And it, part of that group, however, funded this seminar and this initiative, which is the study of inequality. I guess, what's the actual name of the group? Uh, Human Capital? Human and, Capital and Economic Opportunity Global he, Working Group. Global Working Group. <laughs> and it's a working group that consists of some three to 400 members now, which keeps expanding, and different, uh, different subgroups. Uh, organizing meeting and workshops that have met now, uh, in some cases now, like the family group has met now three or four times, uh, if you count uh, from the very beginning of the workshop. But groups that are working on various aspects of matching and sorting, uh, and the various topics that really we're going to study here in this workshop that have to do with inequality. And so this is the first of uh, what we hope will be a series, uh, annual series of workshops uh, studying, uh, fostering the study of inequality from a broader perspective. I mean, inequality is a vast topic, and we're going to try to uh, cover only pieces of it. It's impossible, obviously, to cover everything. And what we're going to do instead is uh, focus on a pretty broad range of questions, but not everything about the study of inequality. And we hope to have people who are leaders in this field uh, and a variety of different aspects of the field. So you can see from the topics of the lectures that we have a very diverse group of people in the sense of having very diverse points of view. Uh, the only thing that's common about them is they're generally quite smart uh, and uh, <laughs> quite creative. Uh, they don't necessarily agree with each other, and that's part of the whole story about inequality. The idea really is not to sort of lay out a particular party line or a particular notion but to actually try to foster the discussion and to create uh, a deeper understanding of what is a pretty vast subject. So uh, you want to add some more about the particular topics? We have some handouts, right? Some brochures on INET and so yeah, forth. Yeah, so uh, I, I, we're looking, we have, are there some INET brochures that are available? Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll bring it. Uh, so it's not, uh, uh, yeah, we're not that well organized, as you can see. We're starting here uh, in a little bit uh, slightly disorganized way. But nonetheless, I think the, the, the topics are really quite interesting. And there's a website, which you can already plug into, uh, which actually gives you working papers and summaries of conferences that we've had. I mean, you might want to try just talk about the conference that you and Scott ran just in May, right? Just to kind of talk yeah, about. Just to give an example of sort of activities associated with ITNET. Uh, Scott Commoners and I, along with uh, Bash Mazumder, uh, who's at the Chicago Fed, had a conference on intergenerational mobility in May, which brought together primarily economists, but also a number of social, other social scientists to basically assess where, uh, where knowledge is on intergenerational mobility. And my half of the overview this morning will be uh, an effort to, uh, uh, to give a perspective on that. Uh, but that's that's sort of the typical INET activity would be a, a focus conference on a topic to get different perspectives together, get different disciplines together, see where the frontiers are, see where uh, synergies can be achieved by uh, uh, moving beyond uh, standard uh, disciplinary barriers and the like. Yeah, and I'll give you another example. We had a, several conferences on the economics of the family where we brought together people who had, uh, you know, keep using the same term diverse and different perspectives, but they really were quite different perspectives about how to think about the family, what the contribution of the family was to overall inequality, the role of the family in producing, uh, in producing inequality through its children and the opportunities available to the children and the notion of a sort of mating and how it is that a sort of mating would actually produce inequality. And so, uh, and there was a conference in Rome, which I couldn't go to, just last month, just a few weeks ago, actually, uh, uh, led by uh, Pierre-André Chiappari, who will be lecturing here later in the week. Actually, uh, only uh, through the internet. Only through the internet. Yeah, it's some visa problems. He's stuck in, uh, he's stuck in France or, or Italy? Stuck in France. So okay, so. America's being protected from 
distinguished academics. So. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So, uh, and then uh, I'll just give you one last instance. We had a conference on the, e we've had a series of conferences actually on the economics and psychology of personality. And there it's actually created uh, a body of work where we put together uh, aspects of uh, research in personality psychology which really hasn't been told fairly recently and been integrated that well into economics. You know, study of preferences for sure has been integrated in economics and the standard kind of questions in behavioral economics have been integrated, but not, for example, uh, the, the, uh, some of the big five traits and exactly what the foundations are. And that's been quite constructive, both in psychology and in economics in the sense of stimulating a body of work. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the course of the, in the, uh, this, this week. So, Actually, yeah. Just mention one other. Sure. Well, the Health Network is also sponsored conferences that primarily were geneticists and epidemiologists. Right. And so, again, there was a, a focused conference trying to understand what constructively can be said about the role of genes in individual behavior using state of the art uh, perspective on genetics, which are miles beyond uh, sort of the classical uh, dichotomies that have been between nature and nurture. Between nature and nurture and studying, going well beyond the kind of typical, typical additive model that's dominated the literature on heritability studies and so forth. So it's uh, more than just kind of having kind of a cute topic that's kind of well developed. We actually have dealt, developed uh, uh, really some new frontiers connecting uh, what, what the subject of epigenetics would be uh, properly described, how the environment is actually shaping gene expression and exactly what the mechanisms are. And then the open question is, is quantitatively how important is that mechanism? It's not just a question of whether or not there is such an interaction. We know that there is, but the open question is quantitatively how important this is. And in fact, that's going to be one running theme, I think, through a lot of the talks in the workshop, is just trying to come up with some measures, some quantitative measures, some assessment anyway, relative assessment of how important all of these issues are. And I'll start. I guess now and go through some of this. Okay, so thanks. <laughs> I'll take over for a bit, and uh, and then and you can stop the me. Governor of California said, "I'll be back." You'll be back. <laughs> Which governor was that? Uh, oh, Schwarzenegger. <laughs> okay, so let me let me start off. Uh, I'm going to start presenting an overview. I mean. I think it's important at the start to at least get some basic facts down, or at least things that are thought to be facts, and some questions that are open in, in, the, in the literature. So I'm not going to cover everything. We could spend the rest of the week going through all of the different descriptions of what inequality is about and what's thought to be known about inequality. But what I want to do is pull together some studies uh, which are all posted on the website. They're all posted on the reading list. In fact, there are too many. You'll see very long handouts. Uh, but what I'm going to give you is basically an overview of several studies um, that are composites of studies of the U.S. economy and then at least OECD economies. Not so much a study of what would be really interesting would be global surveys, including less developed countries, but nonetheless to get some flavor of what the issues are and what what, what is unique about certain countries and what, is, what seems to be general and what are the open questions to understand? Okay, so let me just start out with a very basic. Uh, so this is the list of topics I want to talk about. And Stefano Masso, who's here assisting in various ways, will present a bit about on the, on the very last topic, 12 here in this workshop. So what I want to consider is, first of all, the basic measure of inequality in household income and earnings that's received so much attention the 99 versus the 1, uh, the trends in top incomes, and then the pattern, not just in the United States, but the pattern also in OECD countries. Uh, I want to look at not only the standard dimension about wages, hourly wages, uh, but the distribution of hourly wages, and then inequality in wages, earnings, as it incorporates the labor supply and the possibility of employment, and, uh, and income, which would include things like uh, asset income, transfer income, and involve the larger uh, state. And then I want to consider aspects of even what the statistics look like. And I don't want to poach on the territory of James Foster, but I definitely want to talk about the fact that in the United States and in most other countries, we see that only a part of the workforce is actually employed. And that leads to a serious issue, essentially because those employment proportions are changing over time and the composition of the workforce is changing in a, in a fundamental way. 
And that really has substantially affected the way we think about inequality in its various dimensions. And I'll talk a little bit about that and why quantitatively it's important. Then I also want to consider some aspect which doesn't receive as much attention as it should in some of the, some regions of the inequality literature, but in some other regions it's the whole story. Namely, taxes and transfers, just the role of the state. So you'll see that actually there is a lot of inequality that's fairly universal in terms of levels of Gini coefficients in uh, gross incomes. If you just simply look at the way markets are pricing out factors, you're going to typically find there's much more commonality and inequality, say, between the so-called welfare states in uh, Europe and the U.S. than many people think. But after transfers, after taxes, after various, after the federal and the state systems are put into the data and their net transfer system, you'll see fundamental differences in inequality. Then I want to talk about an issue that's actually arisen. Some people talk about good inequality and some people talk about bad inequality. And the good inequality that many people will focus, and I'll say some of those people are in the general environment here, uh, would, would, be, uh, would be the notion that uh, when the labor market gets uh, a certain valuation placed on high skilled labor, like college educated labor, and sends a signal that uh, highly educated workers should be, uh, should be um, paid more, that sends a signal for people who are thinking about going to school to go to school. And so you say that's a good signal because what it's doing is it's actually producing the supply of factors that the economy needs. So that's the point of view that many people adopt. That's the sort of good inequality point of view. Part one important determinant of inequality, and I want to show you that briefly. I don't want to drown you with data, and if it's all very familiar, you should just tell me to stop because we have hundreds of things to talk about. But nonetheless, we can still see that the labor market is a major determinant of earnings of, of, uh, and earnings inequality. And in particular, uh, when you look at OECD Europe, we're going to see that it's the employment of males still that's driving a big chunk of it, not the whole piece of it, but a big chunk if we do decompositions of inequality. And that's wages, and that's really the labor market. And then we ask ourselves the question, well, okay, maybe it's a good thing. Wage inequality goes up in the short run, but you get a greater supply of labor. And that means then, in the long run, you're going to find uh, that you know, opportunity is increased, that there's going to be greater, uh, greater uh, productivity for the economy, and so forth. But now I want to try to uh, point out to you that there's a downside to this, because there's a real question about how well the labor market is actually working, and in particular, how well the res educational response is working to the price signal. So we see higher rates of return to education, no question about it. But at the same time, what we also see is a very sluggish response. So if we ask ourselves, when the price of education has gone up, so-called rate of return to education has gone up, the price and rate of return are not the same, obviously, um, the, the, the question then re is, wouldn't you expect a much more rapid response to this signal than we actually see? And one of the great conundrums of the U.S. economy, but it's not true across the whole globe, is that we, we actually see that at exactly the time, or roughly the same time, that the rate of return to education goes up, there's a slowdown in the rate of production of education. I mean, education, people are getting more educated, but at the same time, what you're finding is a slowdown in the rate of uh, production of, of uh, education. And so cohorts born after around 1950 are showing an amazingly slow response to what seems like a market that really demands higher skills. And I want to show you some statistics showing that, at least in the U.S., the dropout rate has actually increased in the U.S. population in the last 50 years, even though we you can show that the rate of return to uh, being a high school graduate as opposed to a dropout is estimated to be as high as 50 percent per annum. So there's a real issue of why the markets aren't working. And so that's a real question that's going to occupy at least some of my discussion and some of the discussion of others. Then I want to consider, and it's closely related, the family. What's the role of the family in actually producing supply of skills and in producing opportunity of individuals? And that's something we're going to look at. And then, again, closely related is health. And um, I, I'm going to briefly review. I probably can't cover all this. And you should stop me, Steve, at, at the appropriate moment. I, I really I have a tendency. We started late, and we're already uh, 
And then we're going to talk about consumption inequality, which is another dimension of, of this whole question. And so please, by the way, ask questions. We should try to make this much into a seminar. Yes, go ahead. Is there a way to dim the lights to bring it? Oh, to dim lights? I should be, uh, except uh, I don't have a direct, oh, okay, we have some help here, great. Let's see. And all of this is available, by the way. It's all, it's all posted. So you don't have to take any notes. I mean, you can take whatever notes you want, but it's all available. So then basically we're trying, as I say, to understand the origins of inequality and effective policies for reducing it. And I want to consider the dimensions of economic inequality. So I've already mentioned those. These are some of these dimensions. Wages uh, per hour worked. This is the standard uh, discussion that labor economists would have. Annual earnings, which would include labor supply. How much variation there is in the employment and hours worked of individuals. Asset income. And, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, some measure of welfare. And these are only the notions of economic inequality. I want to look at other dimensions as well. But let me, let me focus on these because these are the traditional uh, discussions. But even here, we need to make some distinctions. And one distinction we want to make that's really important that we see, again, a lot of attention is what we think of as cross-section inequality. We look at differences at a point in time, and then we ask ourselves, okay, how much of this difference will average out over the lifetime? So for example, one of the best established findings is people go to school, and typically in the time they're at school, 20, say in the early 20s, go on to college, graduate school, they will have earnings that are far below the earnings that they will get when they finally finish their educations. And so if you look at the individual at a point in time, somebody who's getting a PhD or getting a JD or something of the sort, their earnings will appear to be relatively low during the period when they're in school. However, when they get out of school, they will get rapid, in many cases, rapid uh, profile of uh, growth and earnings. So the question then becomes, should we look at a single point in time? Is there a lot of mobility in the society? Will these people who look poor become rich down the road? Or is this a condition that's a very stagnant condition? So there's a real question that we're going to look at mobility or cross-section snapshots. And the literature has dominated until fairly recently, recently being 30 years ago or so, 30 or 40 years ago, looked a lot at cross-section inequality. And we've come to understand a lot more on economic uh, and social mobility. And this means mobility within a single lifetime. And then, of course, mobility across generations, which Steve is going to talk more about in a minute. Then we want to consider the units of economic inequality. One is the individual. So the labor market perspective, the labor economics perspective, if you will, is going to focus on the price per unit skill of an individual. But most of the discussions of inequality are actually at the household level. If we start looking at the reports, the 99 versus 1, you look at the CBO report, you look even at the studies by the OECD and uh, many of the popular discussions, are actually reporting household level. And there's a non-trivial difference between the household measures and the individual measures. And I'll show you what they are. But the household brings in a whole series of questions. One is just the simple matter. We have this aggregate living together. And even though individuals are earning more or less, the household itself is an egalitarian, can be an egalitarian mechanism which redistributes. And so do we want to state household income uh, uh, adjusted for equivalence? or allowing for the transfers of individuals? So that's one question. A deeper question and related question, though, is actually having to do with household formation and assortative mating. We've actually seen a lot. And I'll show you what the quantitative importance is in a minute. There's some estimates of this. And we're going to hear about this more in the course of, this, uh, in the course of these lectures. That assortative mating is actually playing a really important role. In fact, we're seeing more and more that highly educated men, highly educated women are living together. And in that sense, we see that that is a force towards producing greater inequality, OK? And uh, on the other hand, we also see a large number of households that are single person households, some of it related to single families, uh, ch children being born out of wedlock and so forth. And that is a source, typically, of greater inequality uh, in a different dimension, in the sense of the look, looking typically at the bottom of the distribution. So the household plays a very important role. And then, uh, not to poach on any uh, territory, but we're going to certainly hear a lot about the social groups, where we think about the, the unit of analysis is beyond the individual, beyond the household, consists of the peers, various kinds of social groups that would constitute social interactions, 
and then we look at things like social norms and, and, and related to discrimination. So, yes, sure. In terms of looking at the mechanism of equality, it seems like there's a lot of focus on the outcomes. Like, are we going to also be concerned about inequality in opportunities? Absolutely. We're, that's going to be a huge chunk of this course. But you start with the outcomes, and then you say, OK, we, you have a certain set of outcomes that might be a desirable. I've only given you a limited list. There are a lot of other outcomes that are there that have to do with uh, the capacity to function, to flourish in the larger society. So I don't want to restrict myself. But I'm starting where the literature starts, and we're going to sort of branch off from that. But for sure, we're going to look at equality of opportunity. And that's, that's a really a fundamental issue. So it's not just outcomes. What determines the outcomes? And what determines the importance of family, the importance of initial conditions of birth, and so forth? That's, and I'll, I'll show you some. In, in the overview, but that's going to receive a, a tremendous amount of interest. And by the way, you guys can also shape these lectures to an extent. I mean, we're not so flexible that we can change them on the spot, uh, although we're pretty flexible. Bert, of course, can change everything right on the spot, but, uh, uh, but uh, yes, please. So why do we, in your opinion, why do we care about inequality? Well, it's an aspect of inequality that leads to political inequality, issues of political inequality notions of social justice, and so forth. So it's a part of it. If the society consists of a very rich group of individuals and a very poor group of individuals that's going to never meet, there are a lot of other criteria that might, uh, in terms of how societies function, that might be impaired by such an unequal distribution. So it's a marker of something more fundamental? Well, it, it in itself, I think, is an important component. James Foster, I will call on you to say, why are we interested in that? Uh, Leading to inefficiencies and in welfare, look at welfare functions with leading to marginal utility. But it can go either way. I mean, I really do think that uh, there's some tempering of this in moving back to a notion of inequality of opportunity. Because that's where the action really takes place that everyone agrees on, even if they don't agree on diminishing marginal utility of, uh, of income uh, across identical utility countries. So that's, I guess, the first step is that we care about it for a variety of reasons. But we all pretty much care about it because of inequality of opportunity. I mean, there's always this classic issue, right? It's saying, well, we think that uh, a Beethoven or a Mozart or a von Neumann uh, is producing these fundamental contributions to society. And we want those people out there, and we want to encourage them. Uh, now, the question is, should von Neumann have been the Bill Gates of his age? Uh, some people would argue uh, he should have been, at least uh, if you rewarded IQ. Uh, but there is something in which inequality is intrinsic. We see that. We want to see how intrinsic it is, how much of this genius. I, I'm not going to be able to specifically analyze whether von Neumann was a product of his parents or, or his genes. I think that will be beyond the scope of the workshop. But there is a sense that we want to encourage this. We want to encourage such people. And we want to encourage, because they do lead society. And they do create. On the other hand, uh, there's also a sense of uh, justice, too. I mean, how many people get a chance to be von Neumanns? And how many people, and, and what are the determinants of von Neumannism? I mean, and, and exactly how do you get there? So we lead up to that. So there is a sense that there's an efficiency aspect, and there's also a fairness aspect. And so the question is, when do these things get in contrast with each other? When do they conflict? And I'm going to argue, at least in my own lectures, that these sometimes there are certain policies where they don't necessarily conflict. Uh, but uh, that's, that's getting way ahead of the story. I don't know if that answers your question. So, okay. No <laughs> yeah, okay. So let me just give you some facts. You've probably seen this. Everybody's seen a version of these facts. This has been in the Wall Street Journal. This is from the CBO. Namely, and this is household income, by the way. We're talking about units. So we look at household aggregates, and what we see is cumulative growth and after-tax income. Here's the top 1%. And what we've seen, starting from 1980, which is generally the benchmark that people have taken, this is the time of the great surge in inequality, is that you're seeing a big change in household income with all of its different components, earnings, capital income, uh, I mean, labor market earnings, capital income, and so forth. And you see this big divergence in the top 1%. I'm going to refine this even further for you in a minute. But you can simply see there has been this widening. And this is what's led to a lot of unrest and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, the Occupy movements around the country. 
And I don't know if you can see these figures. I can barely see them myself, but I think actually it's easier here. And this is just a measure. This is now using the standard tool of Gini analysis. I assume everybody knows Gini and coefficients. Some of the co some of the uh, some of the um, uh, handouts. Oops, am I over time now? No, no, oh, <laughs> okay, that's okay. Oh, you're organizing. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, and so by all dimensions. For example, capital income, capital gains. If you look, for example, a business income like proprietor's income and so forth, or just labor incomes in the labor market, what we see is in all these different dimensions, we see greater inequality. Okay, so the Gini coefficients have become more unequal in these dimensions. That's the cross-section snapshot, but there's no denying that that cross-section snapshot is there. And again, if you look at the source, you can find different measures of concentration. Labor income was much less concentrated than capital income and business income. That's kind of well established. But this is a, a, from I actually all the labels, some of the labels got lost here. This is from a classic paper by Piketty and Saez. Uh, but it's actually showing the top decile, top decile now income share. And what you can see then is that going back to 1917, they have data running back. This is IRS records. Again, it's household income. We see that the household income share was really uh, the top one, uh, top decile was substantial at the top of the distribution back in 1917, 1922. We think of this, you know, the, the period of the gay 20s, you know, where people were uh, the wild 20s and so forth, a lot of inequality. But you can see that we've reached that level again in the uh, period 2007. And this is before the meltdown in uh, 2008 in the markets. And that's in, whether or not you include or exclude capital gains, you're seeing a run up in inequality. Um, and we can look at various uh, income shares. And what's interesting is if you start cutting this down from the top 10% to the top 1%, uh, the run-up is quite dramatic. It's very strongly concentrated. And that's what Saez and his co-authors have actually shown. This is the share of the top uh, one hundredth of 1% in income uh, and going back over the same period from their study. And you can see that there has been a dramatic run up. So in some sense, by this measure, there's more inequality just in terms of income. Okay? And that's what uh, a lot of people have been concerned with. What's interesting, if you read their paper, and it's posted on the reading list, what you can actually see is that the composition of this income has dramatically changed since the 1910s and 1920s. So what we see is a greater share. So as you go down, a typical pattern will be, if you go back to 1929, you can see that this chunk due to wage income, you're like, who who are these people who are at the very top? So, you know, the farthest right figure, the 0.01 percentile that I was showing you. You can see that wage income played virtually no role. Capital income and entrepreneurial, capital income was the major story in 1929, right? Who's there? These are the rentiers. These are the people clipping coupons, uh, the ones who were uh, uh, lampooned uh, during the uh, Depression. Uh, now, if you ask what's happened 2007, so some 80 years later or so, you can see that the composition has changed. It's not that, that capital income has vanished, but you can see that the major uh, occupiers, if you will, of that highest percentile or uh, fraction of a percentile is actually, but actually consists of wage earners. These are large salaries, CEOs and so forth. And in fact, what you're going to see is a discussion. I'm not going to go through it today because there's not enough time. But at the end of the handout, which is a summary of open of facts, and that's like a 300-page handout, you'll see a document, though, comparing the different sources of this high income. And some, how much of it is actually venture capitalists? Uh, how much of it is actually uh, coming in from high pay to CEOs of bankers and so forth? And, and you'll get some interesting statistics by Steve Kaplan, who's here at the business school. What, what, what was on the x-axis of that? Oh, these are, uh, sorry. These are, this is the share of the total component of income due to these three sources here, the wage income, capital income, and so forth. And these are the different deciles of the distribution. And so it's just saying that as you move down, so it's clear that, you know, up the top group, you know, that if the very, you know, the 90 to 95th percentile is mostly dominated by high wage incomes. That's going to be something connected with labor market, something with, uh, uh, with the prices in the labor market. But it's actually, uh, you know, it goes down as you move up. But it moves down a lot more slowly than it did in 1929, whereas basically everybody was, was a, you know, all the very, very, the super rich were living in Southampton and having a great time and so forth. And this is basically a similar figure. So let me, 
Let me, uh, in the interest of, uh, so this is basically the wage share. This is now the wage income share. Uh, this is the top decile wage income share. And you can see that even going back 80 years or so, this has increased just in that one component. I, now there's one thing that's interesting and just sort of lays out on the table. We see this as a phenomena. Uh, uh, Piketty and Saez are, are very much interested in uh, U U.S. But they put on some illustrative figures to show that this phenomena of increasing inequality is somewhat, a, I wouldn't say uniquely an American phenomenon, but it certainly reaches extremes in America compared at least to two other countries. I'll put up some figures here in a minute that's a little broader from the OECD, France and the UK. So in particular, if we look, uh, uh, for example, at uh, France, you can see that the run-up that was there back in 1913 or something, so the very high levels, just hasn't materialized. In fact, inequality in France, when you look at net household incomes, has not increased as much. UK, uh, somewhat. So there's, there's going to be a pattern that emerges from a lot of the data that the UK is following the US trends, but with less, with less, uh, with less extreme. Okay? And, and this is just typical rank pay. I'm, I'm going to skip this to kind of get the idea. But this gives you the idea of the top 1% income share. This is, again, uh, now, income here would be individual incomes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it's very important to keep this uh, in, uh, in, in track. And you can actually see that the pattern in the U.S., which is this top line here, at least the top line at the last part, so the, the x-axis is going back to 1910 when possible and going up to 2010 uh, uh, when possible. And, uh, but basically, you can see that the U.S. is kind of way off the charts here or at least high in the charts, and uh, in some of the other countries, like Australia and so forth, uh, much less. And the UK sort of keeping track. And, and by the same measure, uh, we can actually see uh, uh, that uh, other countries haven't shown uh, the same uh, component, uh, uh, sa same growth. And some countries have really been quite flat. So it's not a universal phenomenon, this kind of high run-up. So that's, that's what I mean to say with this. Let me. Uh, let me move on. And this basically is, is repeating what I said. Uh, if you ask, what's the percentage of primary taxpayers uh, in the top one-tenth of one percent of the income distribution in the U.S. in 2004, we get this kind of occupational breakdown. So lawyers are there, but uh, the real components, executives and financial professions, including management. Okay. So uh, let me, uh, I don't know how much longer, how much longer should I go? Well, no, I, I mean, the trouble is that, you know, there's a danger with facts. After a while, you're going to become numb. And I mean, I'm going to give you so many Gini coefficients. I, I would propose she, she continue or we maybe postpone lunch a little bit. Because I don't, I don't think, I mean, I can, I can summarize this very, very succinctly. I, even though they're like 150 papers, 150 pages, they're really only about five or six key diagrams. At least I can, I can be quiet. <laughs> no, no, I promise you. No, I want to give as much as people are interested in it. But if they're, if it, I don't want to, I mean, a lot of this, I think, has been out in the literature. So let me just go over this more quickly. I, I think we shouldn't delay things too much already. If we start the first day by delaying, then pretty soon you'll say, well, let's postpone this lecture uh, from today till tomorrow, because we'll give the uh, next speaker another four hours. Uh, well, no, it's not. No, it's just, these are just facts. But these are facts that we're going to return to, and hopefully we'll discuss at the end of this seminar to see if we have a deeper understanding. But here, across many different countries, so it isn't. We don't want to just uh, look at, uh, at, at the U.S., even though a lot of the literature has, or U.S. and U.K. Really, the question is, what's been the average change? And these are household incomes now, back to household incomes. We see incredibly uh, rapid increase, but if you look at the bottom decile as opposed to the top decile, we see a huge uh, uh, difference in general that the top decile, not inevitably, look at Ireland, for example. But in many countries, we can actually see that the top decile has been increasing at a more rapid rate than the, than the bottom deciles. And so, but here's the pattern that I think is important to me to keep in mind. 
Namely, if we just look at Gini, this is again now from the OECD document, and uh, I would stand corrected by anything that James Foster would say about how accurate or inaccurate these statistics are. But if we look at the Gini coefficients between the mid-1980s and the late 2000s, what we see is a, a substantial increase. Uh, Mexico has a very high Gini coefficient, which has increased over this period. These are all the countries that have shown an increase. This is the United States as the Gini coefficient. And now, this is in the household income measure uh, with precise definitions given in the text uh, of the document that's posted. But you can see there's been a general increase, but it isn't universal. So for example, little change in inequality in France, Hungary, and Belgium, and actually decreasing inequality is measured by, in Turkey and, and Greece. So it's not like there's a universal claim out there. And people say, well, you know, skill bias technical change is producing universal trends towards inequality. Well, yes, but not universally. And something else here in these countries is accounting for the fact there isn't such a substantial growth in inequality. Okay? So um, now, uh, this is, I think, a key document, which actually, this is a key figure. This is one of the five that I was going to fo focus on. So you've seen the 99 versus the 1. That's been in every New York Times article, virtually every in Economist, and so forth. But this is an accounting done now by OECD, uh, which is the beginning of something really important. I think what we really need is quantitative measures of these things. What, what's missing? And we're not going to be completely successful this week. We kind of hope that some of you will go out and actually, and, and INET can actually support some of you to go out and actually put together quant richer quantitative assessments than what we're doing. But this is an attempt to talk about uh, the different sources of the rise in inequality. And so uh, what we're looking at here is, uh, is what component of this measure of inequality. Note there's a big chunk here called residual. And now, now residual is always an unpleasant category. It means we don't know what's going on. But, but, but almost by construction, we haven't looked at everything in residual. Tax and transfer policy and so forth is stuck into the residual. We'll come back to the residual in a bit. But right now, what this is showing is really the following. That, look, if we were to say what contributes to the, the difference, <coughs> what contributes to these differences in inequality, what we can see is that men's earnings disparity is accounting for about 42% of the variability. So this is the labor market and it's men's earnings. This is men in the labor market. And this is including hours work, uh, men's employment is like another 17%. So that's a huge chunk. Women's employment playing a role, assortative mating which will receive some attention, gets about 11% contribution in equality. It's interesting. And then what we actually see is that uh, employment of women is actually contributing uh, negatively. So it's actually a reduced, uh, you know, reducing inequality by essentially contributing our resources to the household. So the women going to work is a reduction. So this kind of shows you. But quantitatively, it's important to keep this in mind that the labor market, this is really the thrust of what I'm saying, is the labor market is playing a big role in explaining for these overall inequality. And this is in household income. The rest of the story, that 39% we'll get to shortly, but it's, it's important. So, you know, capital gains, uh, capital income became relatively more important uh, at the top of the distribution than the bottom of the distribution. There was unequal access to capital markets. Stock markets opened up in many countries in Europe. There was differential participation both in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, many countries don't even have capital markets or not very well-developed capital markets. But the access to the capital market was a contributor to inequality. So it opened up uh, the, the glories of the, of the uh, various aspects of financial markets, uh, but it also re reduced it. So here we come to one measure about, uh, and this is what I was telling you about the fundamentals. So if we look at market incomes, things that are out there in the market, before taxes and transfers, we ask, what are the Gini coefficients? And again, these are household income measures now. How unequal? So you can look at this, these, these gray bars here as a measure of inequality. And even though they're not all of the same height, they're, they're kind of in the same region, right? They're not exactly the same height. There's a lot of difference. Chile and Mexico are way up there. But if you look, for example, at, for example, Israel, Portugal, uh, United Kingdom, and so forth, United States, the height of those bars, uh, the gray bars, is basically 
uh, about the same. You know, little perturbations with standard errors, probably about the same. Now, if you look at the disposable income after tax and transfers, there you see a tremendous variation. And that's the net impact of taxes and transfers within the state. That's the redistributive aspect that has received a lot of attention. And so I think that's, I think, really a fundamental importance when we look at the, uh, uh, when we look. So you can actually see. So I don't want to claim that when you go, for example, to Belgium, Finland, and so far, I mentioned Belgium was a relatively low inequality state. Well, you can see that it is, but a big chunk of it actually has to do with the fact of the way the tax and transfer system operates. And that would also be true in some of the Nordic economies as well. Okay. Uh, and so here are the various components. I'm not going to go through on them line by line. I don't know if that's so important. But social transfers, uh, personal income taxes, and so forth. Now, the other part of this story, and I can, I can again, I'll try to shorten this, Steve. I don't, I don't think it's, I think it's important because it gets dull to actually go through every single fact. But let me give you what I think are the main facts. But Steve and uh, James Foster, anybody in the room who knows better, correct me, please, if I'm making any factual mistakes. I'm telling you what I, what I know to the best of my knowledge. And that is that, uh, if anything, at least across OECD Europe, certainly in the United States, that this contribution to inequality, this notion of the tax and transfer system has diminished in its importance over time. That in the last 20 or 30 years, the way the tax cuts have been made, the way that transfer programs have been phased out, has eliminated this source of inequality reduction. So that's a fact, and that's a pattern that we will return to. Stefano, you look puzzled. No. Oh, okay. All right, great. Right. Okay. So, Here's, for example, just a kind of another way to say the same thing, not exactly the same way, but if we look, for example, at what cash disposable income is, and then we consider all the income, and that includes in-kind payments. So there's a lot of money that's not easily captured, a lot of transfers. So you give housing benefits, you give, for example, education benefits. Typically, those aren't easily monetized, health access, uh, and so forth, and various kinds of care services. And we can see that even if we look at some of the, the gross measures, or I should say the net measures as typically measured, if we factor in in-kind transfers, we even get a smaller uh, amount of inequality. And that's a non-trivial difference, the non-trivial difference between that gray bar on top, the cap, which is a measure of what income inequality is when you look at measures in kind versus uh, in cash. And then uh, here's, this is more or less uh, the same thing. Okay. Let me just talk very briefly about the labor market. I've tried to establish to you the labor market's a big source. It's not the whole story, but it's an important part of any story of inequality, at least in OECD Europe and in the United States. Huge. And this is a typical graph. I've taken, there's a paper that I posted by Asimoglu and Otter from the Handbook of Labor Economics last, uh, uh, published last fall. And it's a good paper of survey of facts. And this is the typical finding of the, of the ratio of college to high school log weekly wage rates. And what you see is this pattern. Again, the, the kind of the watershed year is around 1980s, 1982 or so, is you start seeing a steady march upward in terms of the college high school wage premium. And this is what's received a big chunk of attention, and this actually is a major contributor to inequality. Not the whole story, but an important contributor. Okay, so that you've seen. And what we've also seen is that if we look at uh, the change in the relative weekly wages of high school dropouts to high school graduates, that at the bottom of the distribution, so refining the distribution even further, we actually see substantial changes over the period, say, 1963 to 2008. Being a high school dropout or a GD is not a good thing, and you get basically much lower wages uh, than you did uh, 40 years ago. And, uh, uh, and, and there, are different, uh, there are different episodes, by the way, in which this occurs. So, for example, we can see that uh, during this period, uh, well, you can see that the episode, this is the cumulative effect, and you can see that very sharp negative effects in these periods here, 79 to 89, somewhat tighter market uh, here uh, at the end of this period. If you put that just the Clinton years by themselves, they were much tighter. 
and uh, with various economic phases. But it's generally not been a good thing to be a high school dropout. Yes? Is this relative to all non-dropouts or just those non-dropouts who don't go to college? These are dropouts who don't go to college. No, no, the dropout, I know the dropouts yeah. don't go to college. I right. mean, the, are we comparing it to the entire population? Including no, these are high school graduates only, at least as measured in the CPS. So these are people who stay at the level of high school graduates. This isn't high school graduate. So most college graduates are high school graduates. Not all, by the way, and, uh, but they're not included here. This would literally be the, so you see, this is a big confusion that shows up in the literature. And that is the price. So, so what is the return to high school graduation, right? Well, part of the big return to high school graduation is the option to go on to college. And so a lot of high school graduates go on to college and the true payment. So you want to think about what the rate of return to being a high school graduate is. It's not just the wage you command as a high school graduate. It's also the option value created to go on to further level of education. So the rate of return is fundamentally different from the price, even though those two get totally confused in the literature. And you'll see a lot of the literature saying, well, wow, the rate of return as a Mincer coefficient, which is basically a price. And sometimes it's a rate of return, but only under very special circumstances. So, but I, I'm really talking about the price and the price of being a high school graduate, exactly. And you get something similar, even worse, when you compare it to college graduates, because college graduates have been increasing their income. So uh, let me not go on. This is just, again, looking at labor market earnings, where we see basically the ratio of female to male earnings, again, the US market. This is trying to adjust for labor supply. So it's full-time, year-round workers, uh, going back at least to 1960. And we can see uh, these are the earnings of men. These are the earnings of women. Uh, and basically, what we're getting is uh, some convergence, around 77% in, in the total overall earnings of full-time, with a gap. So there is still a gap. And that's another source of inequality, which we'll discuss. Now, here's going back to the time series trend and looking at the wage patterns. Again, in terms of James's question, literally, uh, it's, this would be the case of people who are high school dropouts. These are the bottom here of this distribution. Going back to 1964, we can see that their earnings uh, rose relatively and then actually are absolutely lower in real terms in, in 2008 than they are in 1964, okay? And we can see for earnings of high school uh, graduates, well, they've been fairly steady, really a little bit of a decline, and again, the real run-up is at the top. That's for males. For females, a slightly different story. No decline, per se, at the bottom, and then we can see a real run-up in terms of the top, uh, and in terms of uh, high school uh, high school, uh, I mean, of, of graduate school, graduate degrees. And uh, see, this is where things get, and, and you can start looking at where in the hourly earnings distribution these gains have occurred, and we can see there are substantial gains at the very top of the distribution, 90th percentile, and uh, only starting in the mid-90s were the lower quantiles catching up in terms of real wage growth. So there was a long period of stagnation. So during the 80s, to early 90s, we see this stagnation and now some catching up, but still a real gap. So, all right, and similar things for males and females. Uh, this is an issue that's been raised a lot by uh, David Otter, and I'll just raise it. Uh, and there's something that's been recently discussed called polarization in the market. The idea is that we're getting uh, a big decline uh, in real wages, uh, especially at the bottom of the distribution, so the labor market got heavily polarized, but there's a more nuanced interpretation. And if we look at the period 2000, uh, 1988 to 2008, and just again, look at the hourly earnings, so again, we're looking at sort of the individual level now, what we can see is that if we look at uh, the, the, the growth rate uh, changes in hourly wages by percentile, we actually see that there's some growth at the very bottom of the distribution, the lowest quantiles showing an increase, right, over this period, 88 to 2008, as are the upper quantiles. So there's kind of a U-shaped pattern, okay? And Asamaglo and Otter have a, have a paper discussing it. It's useful, uh, and, and of course, if you look at the earlier period, there was this general very negative at the bottom and very positive at the top. So there was this kind of uniform decline. Now we get a U-shape in the overall distribution. However, if we look at, look at that change for males, the U is probably even more pronounced. That's the red line here on this figure, okay? 
So you can see that. You don't see a similar figure for women. It's flat. I mean, it's not, well, I don't see the U there. Maybe you have, uh, you happen to see the U. Maybe, I don't think there's a U, but uh, you think there's a U? <laughs> a little bit of a U, yeah, but it's this, certainly for the male. So it's really dominated by this figure here. So, and here the idea is that actually in the last 20 years or so, we've seen a demand for some of the least skilled. Some of these are associated with services. So precisely at a time, so it's the manufacturing, middle class, that's actually been hit hardest. And Asamoglu and Otter have a, have a, a sketch, a model of a comparative advantage uh, that's based on a paper by Kostanon and Fogel. It's, a, it's an interesting model trying to explain this pattern, but it's primarily a male pattern. And they don't really explain why. Let me just talk very briefly. This is the Gini coefficient when we take uh, how much it's increased. And this is by, again, measures of annual earnings. Uh, this is taken from uh, uh, a paper by Saez and Kopsik, I think. And what we actually see is the Gini coefficient in the U.S. going up. We see levels of about 0.45. Uh, uh, this is, again, in terms of earnings uh, now, not total household income, not transfers. And we see this big increase. And we see a differential pattern going up much more for men than for women's wages, uh, but going up for both. Now, what's interesting is we can say in this notion of the life cycle averaging, when we take averages, so we go annual earnings versus five-year earnings, what do we actually see? Well, we actually see, okay, here's the pattern, which I just showed you at the top, the circles, all workers. And now we look at the five-year er annual earnings, and we can still see that this Gini coefficient business is actually showing stability even when we form five-year averages. We're still seeing a run-up in this measure. So if you look at least, that's one measure of a long term. Uh, you know, getting life cycle measures is going to be a little harder, but nonetheless. And this is kind of the estimate that has come from many different sources. Robert Moffat has some early estimates of this, and there are a lot of other estimates we'll talk about, uh, Stefano will talk about, which is basically showing how uh, when we look at the variance of permanent and transitory, you all know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about permanent and transitory. You form some averages and you get the deviation from an average, and then you say how much of the variance is due to that quote, idiosyncratic shock around the variance, about the mean, and how much of it is just the, the means formed over these five-year averages. And what you see is a general pattern that, uh, that transitory earnings uh, downstairs here uh, have increased somewhat, but permanent earnings have also increased substantially. And that's kind of, I think, the major story. We're actually seeing more, more of these components. And here's the top 1% earnings share. When you take the average, it's basically five years versus one year, I'll stop that. This is somewhat more interesting though. This is the probability of staying on. This is the mobility aspect. So many societies, and we're gonna talk a lot about social mobility. So we ask ourselves after one year, what's the, if you're in the top one percentile, what's your probability of staying on in the top one percentile? And here we can see it's like close to 75, 80%. This is US data again. And now if we go after five years, we're still seeing a very high probability, somewhere between 60 and 65%. So it's a non-trivial uh, persistence. And I think that's something that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, to me, people are troubling. And this is the, the coefficient of uh, five-year earnings and so forth. So, uh, gee, I don't know. I'm starting to question. Yes, please. I'm concerned, I'm concerned that with what degree of precision we uh, are allowed to, to analyze this data on the top 1%. I mean, do the, like the surveys, are they, are they designed to do this analysis? Oh, but to see, the, the study, uh, the, the, the beauty in some sense of the, of the Saez and Piketty analyses uh, is that they have access to internal revenue service records. They have data which allow you, which this is not the normal CPS. If you were to start doing the top 100 to 1% in the CPS, forget it. You're not even going to get those people in some sense. They're not going to be, because that's only a small representative, I mean, small sample, and it's just too small by construction. You know, you're not going to find very many observations. But Piketty and Saez have complete income tax records, and that's what essentially gives them the ability. And they also have Social Security income records. So that's what makes this more credible as an exercise. And that's why their work, I think, was exciting, that it actually gave us some insight into things we haven't seen. And I think Atkinson is engaged in, right, uh, in, in doing, in, Comparable studies in Europe, right? Yep. But again, from administrative records, 
So tell me, what's... Well, I just had uh, a chance to, to speak. He's going to extend what Kelly and everyone have been doing yeah. uh, to cover basically all OECD as far as I can tell. Okay, exactly. That's the plan. But mostly this is U.S. data, right? Uh, Mo I mean, the, uh, up till now, yeah, the uh, the study of the of the top one percent, uh, one hundredth of one percent. So let me, uh, yes. But they have much more than just uh, the U.S. Like they have this website, the uh, World Top Income Database, which I just have in front of me, and apparently they have available series for basically all Europe, Argentina, South Africa, India, China, Australia. So these are administrative yeah. records. Well, over, the introduction says of equivalent uh, quality as the one that they have for the U.S. Equivalent quality? Yeah. I don't know this. Can you make it available? It's easy. It's, it's, you just Google World Top Income Database, okay. and it's on the Paris School of Economics website. And okay. one can judge by himself if you pass your grade year or not. Do you know this data? No, I just to become aware of the fact that they were doing it last week over London. So, I don't know. Okay. So, Something to look at. We'll look at it. We'll yeah, give a report later in the week on this. Yeah. Okay, yes. Just kind of like zooming out a bit. Um, have, have there been any studies to establish the connection between inequality and poverty? Mm -hmm. like, what does increasing inequality mean for poverty or even like some subsistence level of, of people who are being able to live? Well, see, this is the one gap here in what I'm showing. We don't really have such good. The UNDP has these studies of. Uh, of baseline poverty and so forth. But when you start looking at Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and so forth, well, you're really dealing with desperately poor populations, okay? To my knowledge, the data are not anywhere near as rich as what's here. And I think it's a limitation. The next time I give these lectures, I hope next year, uh, we'll actually broaden the discussion to include less developed countries, really very poor regions. So, so there's no, oh, go ahead. Actually, the Gates Foundation is funding LSMS throughout many countries in Africa. They should be coming online soon. There's a lot of action in this area. We're getting better data where it's needed. Okay. Uh, uh, LSMS, of course, is the stuff that uh, the World Bank puts out. Uh, it's being replicated everywhere. Plus, uh, there's... Well, with what level? It's like CPS type data in terms of providing... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the market rebellion. It's the way right. that we calculate uh, poverty worldwide. But there's also other, other types of poverty besides just consumption or income poverty. There's this multi-dimensional poverty index that the UNDP put out in 2010 based on DHS data, and that's covering many dimensions of poverty. And I'll be mentioning that a little bit tomorrow, but it's, it's a poverty measure that I've come up with, with people about. But there's lots of different ways that you can measure poverty and link it to the, to the things that we're talking about here, inequality and so forth and so forth. And I'll, I'll touch on it. I'll change it a little bit to touch on the system. Yeah, I was thinking more to like your point about good inequality and bad inequality is some people may make the argument that inequality in the US has increased over time, but we all have iPads and like cell phones and all these things, even if you're kind of like an hourly wage right now. Oh, no. And in fact, uh, there, there's even a discussion of the benefits of Walmart, right, on raising the bottom. Uh, the consumption bundle. So we're going to talk about that it, it, at towards the end, at least in the U.S. So there really is a different trend between consumption inequality and income inequality. So let me get, so all I'm going to say is that U.S. is, is not the whole story. And that's what these figures are showing. Uh, so we'll come back to that. I'm not going to minimize that. That's extremely important. So these two questions are raised, are really are coming up with more comprehensive measures of, of poverty. Um, there'll be some disagreement on that. Uh, I tend to think of it like a, not a, think, a scalar measure, but a vector measure. And we then start thinking about, I'm very enamored, and I gather you are too, with this notion of capabilities. Yeah. And then the idea of really generating opportunity sets. So instead of just having a one-dimensional summary of what the underlying model of poverty is, to simply say, what is the, what is the opportunities available to individuals? And sort of what, what, what essentially, and, and I'll talk about that, but let me, let me skip past it. I think people are getting restless and I don't blame them. I am, I am too. So anyway, let me just, let me just summarize this. I don't, I don't want to just monopolize this because actually it came to listen as much as to talk, so more to listen than to talk. And so basically then we can simply see, we look at earnings inequality and we go from full-time workers to full-time and part-time workers. Not surprisingly, we're adding more dimensions of labor supply and not surprisingly, we're finding more inequality as we as we march up. Uh, and this actually, I think, is interesting, though, across countries, 
where we actually look at the variance. This is now a, a variance decomposition. It's got its problems conceptually, but it also is straightforward to compute, and many people do this. And so you ask just the question in terms of earnings now, just earnings, paid workers, not household income. What we see is basically a, uh, a big chunk of this, but in, in the, the, the mix varies across countries. So if you look at the variance in annual earnings here on the left-hand side, log of annual earnings, and you can actually see what's the contribution of hourly wages and what's annual hours, and what's the covariance between hours and wages. And you can see that at least in the U.S. you're getting a big contribution. Look at U.K., well, not relative, the same relative magnitude of hours variation. So hours is just the payment per unit skill level, right? And then the hours would be variation in employment and suffering unemployment and so forth. And you can see that uh, different countries vary. So, for example, Israel, very sharp difference. Uh, and uh, if you look, for example, at Australia, there's greater variability in annual hours than there is actually in hourly wage rates. So, again, it's not a uniform pattern. So the, the notion that there's going to be like a single model in many cases has to be substantially modified. Let me just, uh, this, is a, this is more or less a review by country of that overall graph that I put up. So I'm going to skip past this. It's, it's a, you, can, you can read this on your own, I think. Let me, let, me, uh, let me skip forward here. This is the question of a sort of mating, though, which I think is interesting. And the notion of how, when we look, for example, at, uh, at the, what's been the contribution of female employment. So there is this pattern of a sort of mating. And we've also seen, however, that in the last 20 or 30 years, some of the biggest increases in female employment have been generally among women whose husbands are already, I mean married women whose husbands are already relatively well off. That's a contributing factor to inequality. And as we're going to see, that's also a contributing factor to intergenerational inequality. Yes? Yes. That was overall, uh, that, that, again, if you look here, you put that together, that was kind of like the average. But if you look, for example, at countries like the U.S., which is what I was talking about primarily, and U.K. and so forth, that's been. So the two aren't at odds with each other. If you sort of take the overall pattern in the OECD countries, this whole collection, that was the pattern that was summarized in that previous graph. So you're right, I somewhat misspoke. I tend to be biased. I'm U.S. slash U.K. centric because so much of the data is from that. So you're absolutely right to correct me on that point that actually if you look at these graphs, it's not universal across all these countries, right? And that's what led to this, this differential pattern, okay? So stand corrected. All right, anyway, so th this is the degree of assortative mating with different measures. Uh, and one measure is basically, so we go from the early year to the more recent year, and what we see is basically uh, a pattern, uh, again, where we ask are the husband and the wife in the same decile of the earnings distribution, okay? So that's one measure of assortative mating. Uh, another measure uh, is, uh, 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 in, 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 in the quintiles. It's a cruder measure. So anyway. And then we get the other phenomena that single-headed households have actually increased a lot. And this has to do with marital patterns and so forth. So when we think about sorting in the marriage market, we also have to think about the non-marriage market, which is going to receive a role. What fraction of families don't form? And we know that there are many, there's a growing pattern of, uh, of, of, of families that are being formed uh, without uh, uh, single parent families or just single households and that itself is contributing to inequality. Okay, so uh, gee, I think I really should stop very quickly. So let me, let me try to race through some of this. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, oh this actually is a, a repeat slide more or less. This is the difference between market income and disposable income. The same pattern, same point that I made earlier so I can easily skip that. And this is the uh, inequality by source. And this is now looking at the 14 OECD countries, now going across this whole heterogeneous pattern. And now asking, what's the component? If we were to then look at the decomposition of inequality and ask, what are the countries? Wages play a big role. Self-employment income. 
occupational pensions playing somewhat of a role, the redistribution, but income taxes, social security contributions, social insurance transfers are all, and private transfers, all producing forces towards reducing inequality, okay? And again, though, with that pattern changing over time. So let me, let me uh, get, this is too busy. Let me, uh, see, this is where, let me, let me just make one uh, comment. Let me just make a few comments and stop, because otherwise I'm going to, we're, we're not going to ever get started here in the, in the, the lectures. But uh, let me just make one point, though, that is extremely important. In the recent literature, especially looking at the wages of individuals and labor market inequality, there's been a lot of use of looking at quantiles of distributions. I showed you a lot of figures showing what the growth was from the bottom percentile and the, and the second bottom and so forth. So the question I have is the following. We know that the labor force participation rate is changing. And in fact, the activity levels. We saw that more women are working, a greater percentage of women are working in most countries, and a greater percentage of, uh, of uh, uh, and, and a, a lesser percentage of men. So the universe of definition automatically changes. If you actually have a population in which you now have, as I'll show you, here's, here's for example, the labor force participation rate in the United States. This is again from the CBO. And if you look, for example, the labor force participation rate rose, and now it's on its way down. And it actually changes by the level of uh, education and by gender. So when we break this down, for example, look at the labor force participation rates for men and women. We can see that in the category 55 to 64, we can see a substantial decline from 1950. You know, generally the pattern was that men were working 100% of the time, and now you can see that that's fallen. Similarly, if you look, I mean, you just the, the uh, differently, I should say, if we look at women, we can see a pattern where labor force participation rates have actually been increasing. And so the universe, over, remember, we only define these wages over people who are working or are attached to the workforce or have been attached to the workforce. And the composition of the workforce is changing. So there's some recent work that we might talk about later in, the, in this lecture by Sarah Catan showing the importance of actually allowing for this in terms of the, of the measures. So when you look at the measure of, so let, let me just to, to sort of really shorten a, a very, what is a deep concept. If we think about what a quantile means, like the bottom quantile of the distribution, remember what's reported, it's the bottom quantile of the employee distribution, or the distribution on which we measure wages. And if the fraction of people employed is changing, the identity of those individuals would change. And not controlling for that can lead to substantial biases. Secondly, it is also the case that when we think of richer models of how the labor market works, models of heterogeneous skills, where people have comparative advantage in different tasks, that what we find is that the structure of the uh, pattern of comparative advantage would mean that over time, if different occupations and different skills are receiving relatively different weights, as there's a lot of evidence that they are, that who is at the ninth quantile or the ninth percentile or the actual skill represented there will change and with it the price. So you need a much more subtle view. So even though all the statistics, I'm giving you the standard view, the, the next round view is to actually ask the deeper question of who is there and how does that composition change. And that takes us, I'm not going to cover that today, but it, we're going to cover it. And that gets us into a much deeper understanding about what's going on in the labor market. So. Question, you had a question. Yeah. I was just looking at this and thinking about the single-headed household and yes. wondering if anybody or if not investigated the overlap. Like there are fewer men working. Fewer men working. Before exactly. more women working. Before. More women working, correct. And how that was with the and how that contributes to overall inequality? Well, with the single-headed household, I'm just wondering if these are the, you know, because women are either more prone to live alone or more likely to be the head of the, the, the family alone? Well, that is itself a major contributor to inequality, right. just the single-headed household. Uh, uh, with less, uh, that's kind of the bottom of the distribution we're talking about in terms of educational sorting. That typically we're finding some of the less educated women, uh, a lot of women who are high school dropouts, for example, will already be getting low wages. And then the additional negative kick that they're not likely to be as likely to be married. 
And there are sharp ethnic differences, ethnic and racial differences across these categories. And that is a further contributor to inequality across. So we will get to that. Yeah, but not, uh, I just want to make a general point at this point, which is to say, yes, that we really do have to be careful to think of what a quantile is. There's been this whole literature saying that somehow the skilled quantile, I don't know what you think about this, James, but there's a whole literature that sort of identifies skills with quantiles in a distribution. It's convenient analytically, but it actually is, I think, fundamentally misleading, especially when we think of the more recent models of comparative advantage and sorting in the labor market. Okay, well, this is, uh, again, a repeat. Uh, labor supply is a big factor. Taxes and transfers, this is just makes the point. This is, again, for the U.S. data, that basically what we saw was uh, uh, during the period of the 80s and early 90s, a substantial reduction in uh, uh, transfers and federal taxes, then somewhat increase in the role of the redistributive system, and then in the later years, in the 2000s, uh, again, a reduction. And so this, in the latter years, we've seen this period where a lot of the social support system, transfer system, which led to reduced inequality, uh, some of that has been taken away. Uh, and I will, uh, again, rush back. Let me just talk very briefly about this other thing that I mentioned. I really, I do want to finish because this has taken too long. So I want to talk, the, so I, I think it's important though, at least in the U.S., this is not a universal pattern, by the way. It's a pattern in the U.S. and it's a pattern found on some other countries, but it partly depends on policy. So that's why we've got to be very careful in separating markets from policy. So if we look at the U.S., the price increased substantially in terms of the price of skill, but the supply response is sluggish. So here's an example. This is taken again from the paper by Asimoglu and Otter, but it goes back to a paper by Katz and Murphy, really. And that is, well, if you look at the college high school relative supply, remember, this is kind of like the watershed year, more or less, when many people think inequality is increasing. The price of skills is increasing, okay? And so what you see is basically uh, an increase in the supply of highly educated labor relative to less educated labor. It was fairly steady. And then you can see clearly a break. It's not that it hasn't increased. The supply of skilled labor is still increasing. But what's happened is the rate of growth has decelerated, if you will. And what you can also see is that this is exactly the time when you looked at those other figures, if you can remember, when the price was going up. So prices are going up. That's the, sort of the good inequality. And somehow the supply is not catching. Why? That's going to be a big question to, to raise. And uh, here is this pattern that I mentioned. Sure, absolutely. So I'm not sure how popular it is. It's really like, but I know that uh, my mother and father were quite fond of the idea that expectations play a role in this problem. Yes. Just that people in 1976 anticipated a change in uh, composition of labor and anger change in demand for skills, then you would see a runoff prior to an increase in the price of skills, but you would see a runoff in production of education. Right. All the time. Right. And that that would explain to some extent uh, the patterns observed here. Right. Could. So there, there would be some well, but no, but I guess the question is, if the, if the trend still keeps increasing, if the price trend keeps increasing, so that could explain why there could have been some anticipatory response before 1982. Absolutely. But then the question is, why would it slow down? Because the trend itself hasn't slowed down. So what is it about the, what is about the expectational model that actually causes me to to want to slow down at post? Right. So I guess you could say, I guess I, to supplement his theory, I guess you could say, well, these people recognize there would be real scarcity rents. On the other hand, would there have been any scarcity rents? I guess the question is how rational is his expectations model? If you really had a rational expectations model of this, it'd say, oh, gee, we're going to get this big return. And gee, since we all, everybody else knows that we're going to get this return, we're not going to get this big return. And therefore, we might not do it. So I, again, it depends on how far you want to play that out in terms of the. Ex I'm not sure the version you're talking about. Yeah, I mean. But I guess the it's basic. Certainly contingent on you know some. some but I would just ask know. you, why does it slow down? It, let me just step back one thing to the simpler answer. Why does it slow down in the later period? What? Because so, uh, remember, the price is still increasing. So it's not like I've decelerated it. 
it is a from model that I saw, at least it, it came down to uh, a compositional story that there was a high intensity investment before the, before this. I'm not, I'm not saying that I find this explanation uh, fundamentally convincing, but there's a, there's a composition effect in that uh, a lot of people in, invest heavily before the, you know, uh, right. before the change, the structure change, whatever you call it, and then you settle into a new state, say, You might. Now, you know, no question about it. I mean, if you, it, it sounds like it's more of a model of China, right? In some sense, what you see is this massive expansion in China where you get this huge increase in um, education in the last decade or so. I mean, there's been like a six-fold increase in the number of college graduates in the last 12 years by policy. Uh, and you also have gotten somewhat of a diminished return uh, obviously, you start increasing the market for college-educated labor by pumping in six times as many graduates each year into the market. You're going to start uh, depressing prices. There still could be a return to that activity, though, because precisely the return is not the spot price in the market. It's the discounted value of return over the whole life cycle. So even though prices start getting depressed for a while, it could also be that there's this high substantial return, right? So you do want to encount expectations. So it could be that it would be entirely rational for a forward-looking Chinese student who anticipated the market being flooded five or ten years later to nonetheless get the scarcity rent that was there in the market when he or she first you know, got the education, capitalized on that, and then would go back to... Uh, so I think that's kind of consistent with that. So there are stories where that... But the pattern of, so anyway, I, I don't want to, I, I actually do want to dwell on this only in the sense that it remains a question, I think. Expectational equilibrium aside, go ahead, yes. I wanted to ask a clarifying question. Is that completion or is that enrollment? No, this is actually the stock. So this would be completion. It's not enrollment, it's, it's, it's completion. And, and it's the kind of measure that's a little bit crude because the college here is kind of like a weighted average of college and, and some high school and, you know, junior. There's a whole spectrum. I mean, it's always too simple. When you think about the market for education, there are all these different grades of education, even post-secondary education, and they're aggregated together. But this is a, a stock measure. Well, I, I was just wondering if the price of college has something to do with, do with this, because in the case of China, they just open a lot of universities. So right. the quality is necessarily higher. The supply of college is much broader now. Much broader, correct. No, 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 no question in the case of China that there was a change in policy. And in some other countries where you didn't see this marked change in wage inequality, you actually saw a subsidization of education that went on. So, for example, there was a famous episode in Colombia in the 1980s, the country of Colombia, uh, where there was a uh, uh, definite policy to expand uh, college education. And in a time when many countries were experiencing a rise in this college premium, there was a decline. So, I mean, educational policy can promote can, can, can lower this, no question about it. So it's not a universal, not a universal uh, finding. But it is interesting in this case here, which you think about the good inequality versus bad inequality, that the, 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 the relative quality, I guess you could say, of the signal seems to have been somewhat muted anyway. At least we're not getting the kind of response we would have expected. Let me just go on. This is the more dramatic version of this, which is saying, look, Starting in 1950, we have this pattern that the, this is the years of schooling achieved by birth cohorts. This is 1950, so these people are now uh, 62 years of age. This is the year they were born. So this is quite a pattern. And what you see is, a, is in the U.S. now a run-up. So if you look at years of schooling by age 35, a steady increase, and then a flattening, and then somewhat of an increase later as the later cohorts enter the labor market. But you can still see that, historically speaking, there's been a slowdown. You ask, what's going on? Why the slowdown? Non-trivial. And if you break that down, uh, you can actually see uh, for males and females, this is again U.S. data by year of birth, that we can actually see the top figure is the high school graduation rate. And that's actually went to a peak around 1955 uh, for cohorts in 1955. And then it started uh, to decline. And it's actually much different between men and women. So you can see for females, for males, there's actually a decline. And, and this is not just due to immigration. This is not just due to when you take the statistics and get only people who are native born, so no, no 
Mexicans who were coming in with uh, six years of school uh, added to the adult workforce, you get a similar set of figures. Uh, yes, go ahead. When did the primary and secondary education become mandatory in the U.S.? Uh, primary education, man, I don't know the actual years. Secondary education, I think it, uh, I, I know that around 1940, about half of those cohorts started getting uh, high school uh, degrees around 1940. Uh, but I can't remember, uh, I can't remember the uh, years of when compulsory schooling laws came. Yeah, I did just thought that was the most of, one of the more, most, more likely candidates for a, a, a flat going is, is once you've got to that stage where all kids are being forced to go to school until 18. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's still, uh, still there's all this other pull there, which is the, you know, rate of return has really increased substantially. So, I mean, when you think about this, and so I don't know the years, and I think that may be a contributing factor, but I think probably what to me is puzzling is the fact that the rate of return has gone up, uh, and the graduation rate, high school, high school graduation is a pretty basic thing. We saw the wages were actually decreasing substantially for those who were high school dropouts, and yet we actually have a growing fraction of the population. This also uh, becoming high school dropout. So you're right, there are forces this way. Compulsory schooling laws have been increased a little bit from 15 and a half to 16 and so forth, but it's not the whole story. So what you're saying. Uh, anyway, so it's different for men and women. Uh, women, it's actually less of, a, less of an issue. So there is a polarization. So what we're actually seeing is that more people now are actually going to college than ever before. And a greater, or not more people, but a greater fraction is going than ever before. And a greater fraction of the population also is dropping out of high school in the U.S. So in that sense, it's becoming more unequal, and, and, which is another contributing factor. So let me, uh, let me just, you know, this is basically saying how much, how much of the reduction in the high college graduation rate is due to a change in the high school graduation rate. And we can see that this is a substantial component uh, uh, in... Uh, in, in the years of uh, it, it, the high school, declining high school graduation rate is playing a major role, more for males than for females. So in, for, for, for college enrollment rates among high school completers has actually increased. Okay, so anyway, just to put things in international perspective briefly, the most miraculous country in this table is Korea which shows a huge increase in, in at least uh, upper secondary education over the period. Uh, if you look, for example, among the cohorts, 55 to 64 versus 25 to 34, it's almost universal among the younger cohorts. And you can see it was only around 40% in the older cohorts. So in one lifetime, 30 years, short space of time, you see a miraculous increase. Not much change in the United States. And you can see a lot of countries are moving up to high levels uh, if you ask the same thing about the population that achieves tertiary education, again, Korea is a miracle story. You're going from basically around 12% to over 60% of the workforce of population getting some tertiary education uh, with less of an expansion in the U.S., almost no change. But you can say, well, it's at a very high level. So it's not a uniform issue. There has been a massive increase, and a lot of that represents government policy. France, for example, has shown a tremendous increase. And so government policy plays a very substantial role. Now, OK, here, I, I mean, I, Steve, I mean, I, you, you should have stopped me long ago. But let me just talk about the role of the family. I'll stop. What's that? I retain the iron fist for my Yeah, OK, we'll see. So what's the role of the family and so forth? And here we want to consider, and we're going to discuss over the course of the seminar, the mechanisms of the family influence, income, how much of it is family income? That's going to be a story. Recently, we've seen a discussion of the Great Gatsby, uh, the so-called Great Gatsby curve. Uh, Alan Kruger, I think, coined that term. But there's been an association that's been established between higher level, between family income and child educational attainment. It's an old relationship, actually. And some people have argued that, in fact, family income is playing an increasingly important role because as the income of the middle class families get threatened, family income is weakened, and that means then intergenerationally you're going to find that the next generation is not going to get the same level of resources and educational attainment. So many people are arguing that income redistribution per se is going to play a very important role. 
So the, we want to really understand how much of parental influence is due to family income, how much is due to genes, and then separate uh, consideration would be parenting environments. Huge controversial question. Many people, popular books have written on this question of how much parents matter and what goes on inside the family. So the real question is what are the mechanisms of family influence? So what I want to argue is that family income is very ambiguous. So what are we going to ask? What's the role of family income in explaining these trends? And what is the true set of constraints governing the family? So th this just shows you what everybody looks at these days, and it's important. And it, this is people are looking at this even earlier. But here through 2009, you can get the percentage of the college high school completers who are enrolled in college, and you can see there's sharp gradients by family income. No question about it. Nobody denies it. This is one of the major facts. Uh, and these gradients are much less sharp in other countries, by the way. If you go to Nordic countries, if you go to other countries in Europe, you can find much, much less. This just gives you an idea of how different they are. Uh, and so family income, big, big role. Lance Lochner will talk a bit about this, uh, a lot about this, I should say, about what the relative contribution is of family income. And so th the real question, though, is what exactly is the family doing? So the first-hand approximation is that poor children aren't doing as well. But the real question is, what is the nature of poverty? What are the factors in poverty? And then what, in particular, can be done in a sense of a policy intervention to combat that kind of inequality? So here's, for example, one of the dimensions that I think you were hinting at earlier in your question. This is something that got received a lot of attention recently just in the US. And by the way, this phenomenon is not unique to the US. If I were to do the same thing for, the, for Mexico, you'd get even higher percentage, and Chile as well. So many countries are finding this, uh, that basically the percentage of births to unmarried women. Now, why is this considered a somewhat alarming statistic? Because a lot of these unmarried women, as a group, tend to be more disadvantaged, and they tend to provide fewer resources for their children in terms of financial resources. Many of them are also working, so they can actually provide less time input to their children. So that's, a, that's an issue of concern. And here, for example, is just a, a, a pattern, which I think we'll come back to for sure, which is essentially saying here we are looking at the percentage of single parent households by parent marital status. And we look at the trends between 1975, as so again, US data, to 2010. And what we see is that, again, about 20%, proportion of children, family type, about 20% living in families uh, single parent families. Now, the biggest growth is the group on top. And that's the group that's associated with the never married single parents. So these are parents who are, these are children who are lowering in environments there was only a single parent present. And that generally is associated with disadvantage. We'll talk about that. And if you do the same thing across other demographic groups, you can see a huge growth, for example, in the black, non Hispanic and also among Hispanic parents. So this is a trend. And it's not just a pattern in the US. It's also a pattern in many other countries around the world. Yes? Uh, I just want to say that uh, sometimes the single parents, especially single mothers, are pretty young, sometimes teenagers. Yes, exactly. Which is worse. Yes. No, they're young, typically less educated. We'll come up with an inventory of how much less the parental environment is, typically, for a single parent mother. I mean, there's an image out there. I guess uh, 20 years ago, uh, the president, uh, I guess George Bush's vice president, Dan Quayle, was attacking Murphy Brown and talking about the out of uh, wedlock births. And you know, Murphy Brown was a pretty affluent, as I recall, pretty affluent, highly educated uh, uh, lady having a child out of wedlock. And that is just not the pattern in the US so much. And actually, I was recently at a conference in Denmark, and I'd love to hear more information about this, but there's some studies in Denmark. In Northern Europe, you see a pattern of cohabitation. So when you compare the US with some countries in Northern Europe, you start getting these very different measures of what the family is. But what I found, and again, this was something that was under study in Denmark, was that the, dis that the, out of, uh, that the cohabiting family in Denmark was actually uh, 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 still r r compromising its children relative to that of the two-parent family married. 
that there was still less in parental resource and endowment. I don't know. I don't know how well established that is. Actually, I only heard about this, and there are some studies being done. Yes, James. So, how much of this result is being driven by? Do we have a good idea of how much of this result is being driven by the selection of that to uh, those people who have to be single, uh, single parent families? Because I, I know there's this study, I forget the author. Well, selection, what do you mean, the negative effect on child outcomes? You mean, or what? Uh, so, for example, I know there's this study where they've looked at uh, uh, families where the father has died due to an accident yes. at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And they found that that has a relatively, a, a very small effect on the child outcome. Oh, right. Okay, absolutely. You're talking about just the resource flow. So if the, you know, father, the father has died and there's sufficient compensation, for sure. But I'm talking about typically the, pat I don't know what you want to call it a selection effect, but I'm saying that there is essentially generally associated, this is a correlation now. See, that, I'm not claiming that this represents a causal mechanism in any sense, that basically we find fewer resources, and we find fewer resources not just in terms of dollar incomes, just in terms of, per but also in terms of parenting, you, various measures of family environments, early family environments, and these substantially affect the outcomes. Of the, uh, of, the, of the child down the road. But, uh, but in terms of uh, what family influence is, I think it's an open question. Yeah, because I mean, the, these correlations are often used to, as an argument by more conservative politicians to say, you know. Oh, the shotgun wedding. Yeah. yeah, right. No. I mean, in fact, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that a very unhappy marriage, right, can be worse for the children. than a, So you have to standardize for the resources. But that takes us to the deeper question of what is the proper measure of disadvantage for children. And I want to argue that it's not family income. I want to argue, but not today, other than to state it. I want to argue that it has much more to do with the resources that we think provide opportunities for the children down the road. So this gets us back to a measurement question about what is it about, what is, what is inequality and opportunity come down to when we look at, uh, at parenting? Now here, you're going to talk about this, Steve, so I'll just stop. There's analyzing income mobility across generations, and uh, Steve's going to talk about this. So I'll just put this one figure here and simply say that one of the crudest, analogy, one of the crudest fallacies in this literature about how much father's income is related to son's income has been to use annual income measures, simply because they're error-ridden. We saw a lot of, there is a lot of transitory variance, and so this is from one of Mazumdar's tables, that basically the bias in the intergenerational elasticity, this uh, relationship between the income of the child, if you form long-run averages, you, you typically find uh, that the bias in the coefficient, you get substantial bias, up to 50% bias. Here you get much less bias when you go down. And what, so what this has changed is that the intergener estimated intergenerational elasticities over time it, across studies, not across time. I don't think there's such good evidence across time. I think we've only recently been computing this. But you, what you actually see is that you've used longer and longer number of years to measure the measure of father's income and, and, and son's income, typically, is that you find that basically if you use 15-year averages, you're getting elasticities of about 0.6, whereas earlier there was a notion that there was a high degree of mobility uh, decreasingly as low. But Steve's going to talk a lot more about this. And I'll just show that the U.S. is very high on the scale. You didn't have this in your table, so I'll put this on. U.S. is very high, and country like Denmark, Finland, very low. So that's been a stylized pattern, and U.K. again, somewhere in between. And so this is really the notion of how much, immo how much, uh, how much uh, intergenerational transmission there is. You can look at this table. I will. So here are the other dimensions of inequality. Uh, access to markets access to health care, access to parents, schools, and institutions. We talked about that. And then access to political power, which I'm not going to talk about. I'll just talk about inequalities in health that are very well documented in the U.S. Uh, for example, this is showing life expectancy uh, between white males and black males uh, and, uh, uh, in the U.S. And you can see that you're getting, in the year about 2008, 2009, a difference of about 10 years. This is for a newborn. And this is across the whole population. So you're getting substantial differences in health, which is another important dimension we'll talk about. Infant mortality differentials, substantial even across regions. Uh, and uh, again, in international context, the US is not as bad as Slovakia, 
but uh, other than that, uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and, and this gives you some measures of obesity among populations uh, and, uh, and so forth, diabetes and so forth. So there are, many, there are many dimensions. So let me just summarize this by saying here, if we look at health by race, we see substantial uh, differences in uh, health by race. Uh, and uh, this is just a measure of self-reported health, but there are substantial gaps. And the question is, what goes into those gaps? And I would argue that health is an incredibly important dimension of inequality, health by income and so forth. Okay, educational attainment in, in, is well established. I'll just conclude with the so-called Whitehall study, which is actually looking at mortality rates. And it's looking at... Uh, at, at, at mortality rates by occupation. These are all people working for the British Civil Service. And then the question is, CHD is coronary heart disease and so forth, these are mortality rates. If you look at all causes, we can see a substantial difference in individuals. And the actual reason for this has to be carefully articulated. But if you look, for example, as you move up and up the hierarchy, uh, or sorry, down the hierarchy towards the lower level occupations, you're finding much higher level of mortality. These people all have guaranteed income. They're all civil servants. A lot of the sources of uncertainty are eliminated, and you still see substantial differences. So I, will, I was going to go through this, but this is just a standard model, uh, and I think I've overused my time by a good hour almost, so I better shut up. Uh, let me just say that we are going to cover this, though. Just, this is just a standard measure. This is just now a simple deterministic case where you look at income, we want to look at payment per unit labor supply, labor supply, the return on physical assets, physical assets, and then savings is income minus consumption. And so these are just the basic identities of income. But each one of these components we want to explore. We want to look at the payment per unit labor supply, what the variation in labor supply is, what are the determinants of the payment per labor supply, what are the determinants of both asset holdings and return, and then savings rates. Okay. And then we want to essentially look at the determinants of wages. The simplest uh, mechanism would be to say there's a price per unit quantity of, uh, of, the, of the labor in each task. The overall wage is going to be an aggregate of these. And then we're going to look at earnings as an aggregate over these different components. Uh, what we want to make, though, in our, in our analysis is distinctions. Again, I don't know how far you're going to go along these routes, James, but the, the distinction between what would be ex ante decisions and ex post decisions. So when we think about inequality, it, it really plays a huge role. We get information. So one interesting question is going to be how much of the inequality that we see over lifetimes or even at a point in time is due to factors that are predictable, things that have to do with personal traits that you know. You know whether you're smart, whether you're dumb. You probably get a pretty good idea by the time you're age 20 or so. Uh, but there are a lot of uncertainties out there in life, shocks, like the U.S. economy melts down, like there's some uncertainty, you get laid off on your job. So we want to make a distinction between the role of ex ante versus ex post inequality, and then the role of insurance and family transfers as insurance. So here, we want to know how much of the variability, so we look at variance and inequality. We typically are treating all these different sources along the same dimension. They're not the same. Literally, we think of uncertainty as producing an additional welfare cost that heterogeneity does not. So I, mean, I know that I'm resigned to be in a very low wage job, menial activities or something, and I, my IQ is 60 or something. I guess if I'm 60, I might not even know, but, uh, but, you know, if I, but at a sufficiently low level. I have, so I don't expect to be the next von Neumann with an IQ of 60, okay? But uh, how much of that, I can, I can prepare for that in various ways. I can adjust myself. But there's another question about shocks and luck. And literally, this is a whole question by itself. People run regressions. They run regressions y equals x beta plus u. And they say, oh, the u that I didn't put my x's in, that don't, aren't accounted for by the x's that I happen to have, those are all shocks. And that's a mistake. We want to really understand how much is actually predictable and what the welfare costs are of inequality and uncertainty. That's another dimension. Then the question of pricing. What market features determine the wages? How important are market forces versus institutional features? How much about interactions between market forces and things like segmented labor markets, unions, and minimum wages? And then we get to this question of determination of labor quality. I'll use the term capabilities, which I think will be used often. 
Namely, we think about endowments, heritability, and factors of the, how early life factors matter. And then aspects of investments by parents, by the relationship with siblings, neighborhood effects, and larger cultural forces. Okay, so this is a very vague but typical graph, which you'll see in the literature. It has all these arrows pointing all directions. <laughs> and who knows what's going on exactly. Uh, and that's the question is, can we break this apart? So you'll see all these different, so we're gonna look at pieces of this and hopefully we'll try to reassemble it. You know, schools creating endowments, parents creating endowments, social environments. We'll try to break into these linkages. But right now, uh, a lot of the literature consists of drawing these graphs and stopping there. So let me just conclude by saying that the crucial theme that runs throughout these lectures, capabilities. Capabilities, a concept developed by SIN. It's in the UNDP, it's all over the literature. Namely, it's the capacity to flourish and perform a variety of basic tasks in life. Uh, it includes, at individual level, ability and personality. Uh, there can be restrictions and work by SIN and Nussbaum it has a much broader notion, which includes things like political inclusion, freedom of the press, political liberties, and so forth. And I'm going to talk a bit about this in my lectures, uh, and namely looking at the agent's vector of capabilities, cognitive, personality, and health stocks, and asking how these vectors of capabilities get formed, how they get priced through tasks and occupations. I'm going to use the generalized Roy model and consider this under uncertainty, look at earnings dynamics measures, and the capability formation process, how, uh, and the, the, just schematically, how at different stages of the life cycle these capabilities get formed and at what stages and for which capabilities are interventions most effective. So that's going to be a, a theme. And again, beyond nature and nurture, we've talked about that, uh, what the education rate of return is, we talked about that, and then adult skills and so forth. So uh, I think at that point uh, I will stop and we'll talk briefly, right, about consumption measures, which I did skip. And Stefano will talk about this, uh, uh, unless we're way over time, which we are, of course, but. No, I, I, I obviously you should speak. My proposal is, after Stefano speaks, we'll take a 10 minute break. I'll give the second uh, part of this talk, and then we'll break for lunch early, and then Rachel will have the afternoon. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, sorry. Again, this is, the, this is a somewhat, this is the first time we've done this, and I, Although this is not the first time I've gone too long, so. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, we want to consider the other dimension which takes us closer to a welfare dimension. It's the individual level of consumption. And so Stefano will summarize some of these studies. And by the way, everything that I just put up is contested. Not everything, but a lot of it is. So we'll talk about the contesting of this, you know, exactly. I'm not, some of the main facts are not contested, but the exact interpretation of what inequality is and all this will come along. So, any questions though, or remarks, or? Bert, yes. Just a remark on where you find the monuments. <laughs> uh, there's been a principle enunciated around the Crown Institute for about 40 years that says, go to a place where there's persecution, and that's where you should be recruiting young people. And they largely finalized done that. So you look for persecuted people? Go to countries where there's persecution. Ah. Does that's China where, count? That's where the people are <laughs> There must be some limit, right? In the person <laughs> I mean von Neumann, as I recall, went to a very nice high school in Budapest, right? that produced quite a few people, like uh, von Neumann and uh, who? who? Wigner. Wigner, von Neumann. So these are not slouches, uh, none of them. So, and it was a Lutheran high school, right? Yeah, so, it was a Lutheran high school, so maybe that's the key. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah I think if it gets too oppressed, you might find yourself, yeah. if you're at the level of Malawi or Haiti, I wonder how many von Neumanns can emerge from that kind of uh, environment.